This is Zhao. His ability to make money is only limited by the mercy you're willing to show your CPU, and he is, most importantly, quite big. This rather hefty central obesity he possesses has led to him being recently diagnosed with diabetes not good, in his home country of the United States. Even worse, to pay for his comparatively cheap treatment costs, he needs 500,000 gold. But the problem is, his life expectancy is that of a homosexual in Saudi Arabia. So Zhao sets off to do the impossible with nothing but a 100 turn head start. And in return, he can only build two cities and has to trade all his gold at turn 100. So sit back, smash that like button like you were Ted Bundy at a necrophiliac convention, and relax as I deliver entertainment directly to your corneas. To make the most of his ability, Ja requires us to answer the question of how many sieves can fit in a game of Civ 6. The answer is 61. But with most dying in 20 turns due to the term economists have coined resource wars, how will we ensure we meet every sieve and gain the most from our ability. Hello, secretary. Yes, let everyone know I'm booked for the day. With the map revealed, I can use this buff to settle the most optimal location and meet the neighbors who may or may not be looking to contort my body into unorthodox positions. To the south is Wilhelmina, our diabetic darling. Matthias flanks the north with an easily plugged choke point and Eleanor will be too busy dodging knife attacks to get much of anything done. To deal with the threat of Matthias and Wilhelmina, we use our warrior to block off our pass to Matthias, which still leaves the south where the lowly slinger proves insufficient. Luckily, Sid Meier has answered my prayers and sent in a war cart, but I soon realize nothing is free in this life. After what many would consider cruel and unusual psychological torture, we need to scrape together enough funds for our first trading fleet and begin our inevitable snowball. And while yes, God King will technically make a dent, we need something bigger. And what can be bigger? than horse cocks. After finding a herd near our capital, we forcibly breed them before selling them overseas to various political streamers. How will they cross oceans when even our boats can't? I couldn't tell you, but with our successful eugenics program, we have enough funds to purchase our first trading vessel. But more important than all the Portuguese buffed yields is the two key sieves we need to trade with before anyone else. The first is Cleopatra, who grants extra food and growth, which will allow Portugal to support a much larger population. After maximizing food imports, we will continue by sending over the Ozempic that Zhao has recently developed resistance to, down south to Wilhelmina for her gold digger agenda. With this growth and southern security, our diabetic darling in this axis of insulin resistance is getting a little too chummy. She sends a settler that threatens to swallow Lisbon's workable tiles, and with no more than two cities, we're going to need all of the tiles we can get. This threat to national security needs to be dealt with swiftly, and to do that, we buy up every adjacent tile to reserve land rights. But while this does give us the maximum number of workable tiles, the cost is the depletion of our gold reserves that were being used to expand trading operations, so while we wait for that to refill, we prepare to expand our business cap. There are three things I can do that will give more traders. The first of which is necessary for the second, being a harbor. The lighthouse will give the city one trade route and allow construction of the Colossus, which grants a second. The third is another wonder which requires a reserve of cattle, the Great Zimbabwe, which works exactly like the Colossus. With this, we have all the traders we will need factoring in the harbor for our second city, but those traders will need cities to sell to. And so we begin exploring the state of the world for the most profitable business ventures. The southern continent is looking like a Middle Eastern country after the man with a large quantity of metals gets mob banged. Congo and Mali are displaying some of that black on black violence Fox News keeps talking about. And Paris got their cherry popped by Germany again. Uh, maybe giving a live broadcast of the world's events wasn't the best for consumer confidence. To ease our investors' worries, we have to stabilize Lisbon. To do that, we send in our governor Pingala to peacefully subdue do the protesters with military-grade firearms. The Hanging Gardens to distract the people from massacres that didn't happen. And to turn the coast into a tourism hotspot, we discover how to ride the water in contraptions our people are calling. Boats. What the fuck were the traders doing this entire time? With our people now calm behind a veil of bread and circuses, investment has returned to stable levels, equating to about 120 gold per turn by turn 50, which would leave us on pace for uh, 12,000 gold. 
That won't even get us to the principal. With Zhao's treatment at stake, our recent graduates from the navigation school make recommendations to establish trading alliances for faster advancements in science, culture, and improved trade relations. Not only Wilhelmina, who will protect our southern border, but we add in China and Mali too, why the hell not? Cementing our alliance of people who parallel park in the shower, we'll call it the Tritartpi Pact. Trajan is too emaciated to join, but despite his leaking of Zhao's Discord DMs with underage girls, we're still obtaining more traders and yields for further development. This golden age for our people, after sifting through multiple strongly worded letters, can be used to our advantage. By calling for crusades against communism and unpilfered hills, we can improve production to obtain a specific wonder which this challenge would be impossible possible without. But before that, we practice on the Great Zimbabwe. Well, you know, the sea is so much nicer this time of year. With this boost in productivity being all we need to set up for this golden age, we can afford to take the rest of the time to look at world affairs while the slaves complete the Colossus. I realize the woman who could get me to do terrible things to innocent people on a mass scale is in the game. Rome said they'll do it themselves. Hungary is invading Eleanor, but her uniting of the knife gangs around her flag is proving stiff resistance. Man says getting raw-dogged by Family Guy's John Herbert for modern audiences, and Germany still owns Paris. If this keeps up, I might have to invite this master prestige fat ass to the central obesity powers. But before I can get Zimmerman to send the telegram, my merchant class tells me they're running out of cities to exploit. We need a second city. With my 451 gold per turn at turn 75, we are on pace for about 45,000 gold. But even with the settler, Wilhelmina has taken up all the space on the continent. So where do we settle? Well, I wasn't going to settle on this continent anyways. You see, we need a central position to maximize the amount of cities we can trade with. Somewhere on another continent, perhaps to make use of the 25% gold from colonization. And so our settling party is going to cross the ocean to this island. While they make their journey to lands undiscovered, we work on maximizing the benefits of the centrally located city with two wonders. The Colossus for the free trader and the Mausoleum of Helicarn for the extra engineer charge to build our late game wonder. But while we think about building a wondrous site for our people, our settlers discover bountiful hills as they regain their faith after a long voyage, settling Visu. But with the clock approaching turn 100, how will we set up this city fast enough to be effective for the challenge? A three-step process using all the gold in our reserves. The first thing we need is buildings to increase food and productivity, which will boost all yields respectively. After that, we need to expand our reach and provide jobs for all our hardworking people so that they too cannot afford to pay for ambulance rides. But with such fast growth and so many jobs, we need to expand our control to maximize unemployment, and turn production sliders all the way up. Finally, all our educated populace will be sent across the world to sell rare and exotic goods for profit. With this, our city is up and running, but the development was costly and we paid a price. With no goal to attempt to reach a positive era score, we are locked into a dark age, but worst of all, there are no good dedications. So how do we escape? Well, we could join the emergency against Matthias, who's recently realized knives are no match for chlorine gas. The goal of this challenge is to get Zhao to survive. The mausoleum will grant us at least four, which is a sizable chunk, but the big boosts come about due to Zhao's Portuguese roots. The navigation school is a unique institution where the navy is in control of research and development. Speaking of which, the NOW is an effective naval unit which can increase trader yields with their unique improvement, as well as their plus four extra era score. But to increase the trader yields, we have to use the Fittoria, which requires using the Nows charges, which... You know, that's a little too much effort with about 61 sieves on the map. We'll do without. I mean, you see, after only one charge, we've essentially secured the ensuing Heroic Age, which is going to be pivotal for this challenge due to one unique dedication. But before we get into that, the clock strikes midnight. It's turn 100. We are making 1,243 gold per turn 
on pace for well over 120,000 in 100 turns. We got this in the bag. And so, after selling all of our gold to our diabetic duo, the challenge officially begins. But how do we make more money after maximizing our traders? Well, the first step is to improve resources in our empire and then trade every resource we acquire for gold or gold per turn. But you know, no one will want to work in a Victorian era production line dystopia. We have to get them high on crack cocaine, or Civ 6 likes to call them luxuries, to get them to ignore the challenges of life and get that sweet 20% boost to all yields, including gold. Now, would it have been more efficient to get this done earlier for the science and culture? Eh, probably, but I'm sure we'll be okay. With our people inspired to work and the masses subjugated, the ruling commune needs a reshuffle, and thus our most trustworthy allies, the merchant class, will take over government in a merchant republic, something my naval officers from the academy assure me will lead to a 10% boost in profits. By starting a trade confederation, we'll also be able to share technological secrets with trading partners, and finally establishing caravanseries will further increase trade volume. With this, our two cities have fully maximized profits, and Zhao's operation is all but paid for, especially after we run out of buildings to construct. Without anything better to do, we set our people to keep our harbors nice and spiffy, to increase gold in accordance with production. With this, everything is maxed out and looking at our gold production 20 turns in, we are at 1740 gold per turn. Still far from reaching 500,000, so why am I so confident? Well, the Tour de Belém just finished construction, which not only improves trader profits, but the triangular trade adds an extra 130. But we can also use food and production to make more gold. How? With diplomatic service. This policy gives food and production to trade routes, which increases population, thus increasing yields, including gold. And after just five more turns, we're at 2,000 gold per turn. And with 20k already in the bank, we're on pace for about 170,000. We're getting closer. With Cities and Wonders maximized, there is still another avenue we can use to fatten our pockets. Diplomatic relations. By joining the competition to aid Chandragupta after a disaster, we almost guarantee 150 Diplo favor, which is a few thousand gold minimum. Uh, but there is a problem. This is why I really decided to autopilot and completely forgot about the challenge especially when emission penalties came into play. But who needs international competition when each trade route is giving us 30 gold, 3 science and culture, number 1 in research and development, even Yedwigo willing to be seen in public with Zhao, he's got it all, I'd say this sounds like a second golden, or maybe even a heroic age. But forget about the other two dedications, there is only one we really need for Zhao's operation, reform the coinage. This grants 3 gold per specialty district in foreign cities, bumping us up from 2.4 to 3.2 thousand in a single turn. But will this heroic age last until the challenge ends? Now oh, that remains to be seen. And finally, there is still one more avenue we can use to increase our profits further. Subterfuge. Siphoning funds alone has about an 84% success rate and only a 2% chance to die? No wonder Jordan Belfort did what he did, it's free money! Speaking of free money, there are two governor titles we have to give and only one combination out of a possible combination of infinite possibilities will give us an immediate boost. The Void Singer's Chorus granting money from Faith. Now, I could have done this all the way back in turn 100, but again, autopilot. We will be fine. No, Lee, we get to colonial taxes. That 25% boost is gonna be your gaz. Uh, someone failed geography in high school. Excellent timing. Braxis, take notes. This is what geological rape looks like. Finally, we sign a secret pact with Wilhelm mean it to fix the prices of inelastic goods the common people can't do without. We'll call it the anti-cauliflower pact. Let's check back in on our spy. Well, putting that spy where we put the Pingala massacres all seems good. There is, though, one mistake I made that had the potential to sink the entire campaign. Building a commercial hub. Now, this was built both for more money and wonder placement. A necessary evil is it being turn 150 with just 3,600 gold per turn. Now, we were on pace for about 300,000 gold. Yeah, I'm gonna need that great engineer to consume that elixir of life ASAP. It might take a while. The wonder that is, not the commercial hub. 
club. But even still, me and Zhao could have avoided that mistake by thinking and not mindlessly pressing next turn instead of thinking the challenge was over. I would have realized that other civs were siphoning funds, but something happens. We don't lose much gold. And with the stockpiles of other civs growing, this is actually a good thing. We can trade for their large quantities of gold manufactured out of thin air while keeping our gold. Now, while corruption is considered a bad practice, my moral compass is a roulette wheel. In other words, siphoning is no problem, yes sir, no auditing here. And then, it hits turn 175, the end of the second Portuguese golden age, cooling the economy to just 3,200 gold. But while this still will be more than enough for Zhao's condition, I realize something. We should be making more gold. The GPT says 3.2, but we're making less than a thousand. And that's when the realization dawned upon me. Siphon funds doesn't take all the gold, but it reduces gold per turn gain. And well, they've been siphoning me twice or three times every turn for the last 50 turns. Zhao is royally fucked. With 330,000 gold remaining and making less than 1,000 with just 25 turns, the naval officers let me know, oh, the math ain't mathing. There were so many things we could have done better. Take Void Singers earlier, care about emergencies, keep emission downs for Diplo favor, pay attention to the siphoning of funds with some spies. But after a brief period of browsing some caskets for Jow, I realized something. I still have a plan, and that one wonder is still in place. So maybe I didn't play the best game early on. If I start focusing now, maybe, just maybe, we can claw out of this deficit. That is just how powerful this wonder is. It's time to lock in and load the Big Ben. You see, the Big Ben increases gold reserves by about 50%, so if you have 100 gold, it gives you 50, and now you have 150. With this math, my naval officers calculate we need about 335,000 gold, and Big Ben will take care of the rest. I mean, you would think a stopwatch would be cheaper, but well, inflation, I suppose. There is one caveat, though. To maximize this wonder, we need to wait until the last possible moment to get as much money as possible. And so we send some spies to fight the bankers' corruption, and now we wait. And before too long, we finally find other challengers to our wonder, quickly making use of our engineers to build until we are one turn away, before spending the rest of the game constantly checking for progress, combing through hundreds of schematics, trying to wait to the last possible second. Turn 185, turn 190. Finally, it's time. Turn 199. One turn left, and I have 198,000 gold. So, we lost. Or so it would seem. While we are well below 335,000 gold, there is still one last trick up my sleeve. The fire sale strat. We trade everything, resources, gold per turn even, our prized second city. I would sell our gold for gold if I could. But after trading quite literally everything, it was time. Lock in the Big Ben. And after it completes, how much gold does Zhao have after 100 turns? We failed because of corruption, yeah, but more importantly, we failed because of hubris and arrogance. But while we didn't achieve enough for Zhao's treatment, 400,000 is still impressive, and enough for whoever is in Zhao's will to live a comfortable life. But that begs the question, how does a peak TCLR subscriber lose focus in such a crippling time? Who knows? Anyways, I have a 400,000 gold life insurance policy to collect. Check out this video where I do what I'm not about to do and collect fraud payments from Vietnamese rice farmers in the ancient era.